Hi. Here is, and we read a lot of time. Um, we are on day nine of our story. Um, and we are reading Here in the Real World by Sarah Pennypacker. Um, we are reading about Ware and Jolene when we left off. They had just gotten access to water in a place down the street and um, they were using the hose to try and fill their moat um, around the garden, old lot area. So that's what they were working on and we're going to pick up and read some more, okay? We are on chapter 47. We're actually going through this book faster than I thought we would. Um, okay, here we go. Jolene drew out a knife and sliced a papaya plant off its base. Sitting beside the plants, Ware dropped his movie camera and grabbed his ankles. Only the females make fruit, Jolene explained. You can't tell which they are until they make flowers. See here, the male flowers spray out, kind of stringy. The females have fatter flowers close to the base. Ware looked over at the rest of the plants, happily growing, with no idea that half of them were wasting their time. So, what? The ones that turn out to be boys? I mean, males? You kill them all? Almost all. I keep a few around for pollination. She hacked down another plant. The plant fell over with a cry of betrayal only Ware seemed to hear. It's not their fault they can't make fruit, he tried. They shouldn't have to die for it. Maybe you could plant them somewhere else. Jolene shook her head. You can't transplant a papaya. Their roots don't like to be disturbed. That's why I start them in cans. When I know which ones to keep, I can slide them out. That doesn't cut any roots. She glanced up at her apartment. One, some people start growing in a place. They don't want to get kicked out. Ware knew she meant to say plants, not people, but right now he didn't care. Well, it's not fair. Jolene put down her knife. She smiled with goofy wonderment and smacked her forehead. I keep forgetting we're in magic fairness land. Then she frowned, a clowny, sad face, and smacked her forehead again. Oh, no, darn. Still here in the real world. Ware felt a growl, an actual growl, rumble in his chest. Why do you even care? So what if I live in magic fairness land? Jolene cut off another stalk with a savage slice. You're not a realist. You want things to be magically what they're not. You have to be a realist to survive in this world. Ware shifted uncomfortably. What do you mean, survive? Make it through. Life. Life's going to crush you if you don't see it coming. Ware looked around. It didn't help that he was surrounded by flattened playground equipment. This lot hadn't seen it coming. What should I do? Open your eyes. Look out for life coming to crush you. Ware got up and walked down to the moat. Jolene was probably right. She usually was. She'd been right about the baptistry. He'd looked it up that first night. He'd checked about those rakers and the Black Plague. She'd been right about that, too. And about people breaking into landfills and about nobody caring if you stole water weed and about bar water being free to take. Jolene was right about everything, so he needed to get reborn, not just as someone whose report cards were said, where is outgoing and normal and who lived a purpose-driven life and watched over his grandmother, but also as someone who could open his eyes, see life coming to crush him, a realist. He lifted the hose that was filling the enormous do-over tub. The water, as far as he could tell, was just plain water. According to Jolene, the preacher had said some important words over it to make it holy. He and Jolene were the closest the lot had to a preacher now. The water actually came from the grotto, so Walter should have a say too. He gave Jolene's words first. Everything was something else before. Hoo boy, he added for Walter, tell me about it. He thought for a minute about what would be his own contribution. The outside is part of the inside when it's people, he said at last. Maybe the words weren't important, but they were the truth. Chapter 48. For three days and three nights the water ran. When Ware arrived at the lot on the fourth morning, he nearly fell off the oak branch the way he had on the very first day. Ware turned on the camera. He dropped to the ground and flew across the yard. He turned off the hose and ran up the drawbridge. They'd done it. Instead of crane-killing pavement, the church was actually encircled with harmless water. 
It gleamed like liquid sapphires in the camera lens. Ware wished there was a seat behind him because suddenly he really needed to sit down. Then he realized something pretty great. There was a seat behind him. There were rows of seats behind him, in fact. Great long rows of seats, long enough for a whole flock of people to sit on, ready-made for admiring the wonder of things. He located the end of a pew and began plowing off shingles and boards and screens and insulation and chunks of concrete. When he cleared off a couple of feet, he kept going, because number five in the Knight's Code was, Thou shalt persevere to the end in any enterprise begun. He cleared off the whole thing, and then he went to the janitor's closet to get some rags and cleaner. He polished the wood until it shone, and then he sat down dead center. On the back of the pew in front of him was a brass plaque carved with the word, Behold. It seemed to be an order. Ware folded his hands together on his lap. He lifted his gaze to where the moat sparkled through the gaps in the wall, and he beheld. Chapter 49. Behold, Ware ordered Jolene when she got there. But Jolene had been beholding since she'd run into the lot. Wow, she breathed as she settled herself on the pew beside him. And it's not leaking? A few places. I'll patch it. We'll keep the hose trickling. Plus, it rains every day. As if to prove him right, a bank of dark clouds drifted toward them, traveling, trailing veils of rain. This was lucky because Ware had something to ask. And under the table, Jolene would answer. Under the table, she took off her sunglasses and he could see right into her soul. He got up and led the way. You said the people went back to their old ways after they got dunked, like going to the bar. How did you know that, he asked, when the candles were lit. Jolene shifted. I only said one did. But how did you know? My window is over the bar's parking lot. Okay, but how did you know about the rest? Hitting their kids, you said. Drinking the rent? Ware looked right into her eyes. He looked into her soul. And he saw something terrible hiding there. He learned who the one person was. Your aunt. Jolene put up her dukes, cartoon fierce. I'm almost bigger than she is. Ware found his arms curling too, as if they were a team. And drinking the rent? When my papayas are ripe, we'll always have the money. Ware was struck silent for a moment. He hadn't known Jolene's home was at stake. You won't lose your garden, he said, hoping he sounded more than, more sure than he felt. Jolene nodded. I can't lose my garden. Then she leaned in and squinted right into his eyes. She looked as if she were trying to see into his soul. How come you're so interested anyway? Are you trying to get yourself reborn? Ware turned away. He could use some mirrored sunglasses right now, or a pair of Nictitating membranes. I'm going to have to look up that word. Um, he kept his gaze on the candles. Of course not. It's all stupid anyway. A do-over tub. Ha ha. Saints and angels. And all of it. Right. Except for saints. Where left? I thought you were a realist. I'm just writing the word down. It's very odd. My children's books come across a word that I don't know what it is. So. Jolene shrugged. Saints are real. I see one every day. The instant Jolene left for the Greek market, Ware marched down to the moat. He started to peel off his shirt, but he remembered in time. The preacher dunks them, clothes and all. He waded to the deepest part of the moat. He took a moment and made himself perfectly still. Make me a different person, he wished. As hard as he could. Make me normal. He filled his lungs and fell back as hopefully, as start overly as possible. He kept his eyes closed because it felt wrong to be looking around, enjoying the view at a life-changing time like this. Then he got up. Ware assessed himself. He felt cooler, less dusty. His mosquito bites didn't niche. But did he feel different inside? No, he did not. He felt exactly the same. He heaved himself out of the water and climbed the back steps. And there, dripping pools of water onto the church floor, he realized he did feel different. For the first time ever in the lot, he felt sad. Chapter 50. My father says he can't tell a bank what to do. He's only a city councilman. Swing, crash, boom! Where actually grunted at the blow as his ruined pledge crumbled to dust. And beside him, Jolene staggered a step back. He straightened up and mustered a protest. But we covered the pavement with water. Look, those cranes can't get hurt now. That was the deal. Um, 
A city councilman, Ashley repeated. That's a person that does city stuff like programs and budgets. At that, Ware felt a very small click in his brain, like a tiny key being inserted into a good idea. Before he could pursue it, Jolene interrupted his thought. It's who. Your father is a person who does city stuff. Unless your father is a thing, not a person. Is he a thing? Jolene's attack surprised Ware, but it shouldn't have. Sometimes when castle defenders threw down rocks on an attacking enemy, the enemy picked them up and threw them back. He just hadn't ever thought of grammar as a weapon. My father is a person, Ashley said, recovering, but he's not the head of the bank. Jolene shot her a look like a lance, steely and sharp. Basically useless. She smashed the mosquito. Just then a flock of white birds floated down. They began leading a purpose-driven march up the slope to the papayas on long pink legs, pecking the ground with long pink bills. Jolene flung off her hat, revving up for a charge. Ashley stepped in front of her. Hold on. You want those ibises here. They eat bugs. Cutworms, Jolene demanded. Will they eat cutworms? Are they worms? Then sure, they eat worms. They're caterpillars. Um, caterpillars? Like popcorn. Jolene settled back, but Ware could see she was going to keep a sharp eye on those ibises. Those ibises weren't going to get away with anything. Ashley hurried after the flock. You birds, Ware heard her comfort them. This is your place. I'll keep guard. Jolene turned to him. Now what? I pledge, you said. Ashley will get her father to stop the auction, you said. Some plan. Ware swallowed hard. Well, that was plan A, he agreed. Plan B might be a little different. Luckily, Ashley came back down before Jolene could ask what plan B was. She swatted around her head. Birds would help these mosquitoes, too. A single purple martin will eat a thousand mosquitoes a day. Hope some show up, then. Where scratched at a bite on his arm. They've been terrible this week. Well, duh, standing water. Ashley swept a hand toward the moat. You made a mosquito factory here. Standing water. Of course. Each week, Ware's father tore around the yard, upending every leaf and bottle cap that might hold a drop. So if the water moves, the eggs can't hatch, right? Number two on page 11 of his report. Thou shalt always be prepared to help others in need. This was his moment. He was prepared. He lifted his jaw and thrust out his chest. He stripped off his shirt and leapt boldly into the water. Chivalry. Not such a crock after all. Chapter 51. For the next few days, coming up with Plan B occupied much of Ware's time. It was extremely satisfying work. Most of the scenarios involved chaining himself to the ruined church or lying down in front of Jolene's papayas when the bulldozers came to scrape the lot. He'd face those machines down, ideally surrounded by a crowd of breathless admirers, including a national television crew, unafraid in the face of danger. In all the scenarios, the machines backed off. Jolene's admiration would know no bounds. She'd laugh her soft, gurgling laugh. Maybe she'd even hold his hand again. But there was a problem he knew. Even if he had the courage to follow through, which was not entirely certain, his parents surely held strict positions against a kid challenging a bulldozer, especially if that kid was the only one they had. Overprotection, one of the many disadvantages of being an only child. Since forever, Ware had wished for a sibling. Didn't matter which, brother or sister, his mother wouldn't have a spare minute to hang over him. She'd be so busy scheduling feedings and nap times and diaper changes and then later play dates and ballet classes and ninja camps. This brother or sister would be nuts about sports too, so his father would finally have the kid he wanted sitting next to him on the couch instead of a boy who couldn't remember the difference between innings, sets, and quarters. Or maybe it would go the other way. Maybe the new kid would be an even worse disappointment than he was. We should have appreciated where more, his parents would realize. He's terrific, just the way he is. The only problem with having a sibling would be his room. His room was the only place on the planet he had some privacy. When he closed the door, every cell in his body sighed in relief. He didn't think he'd survive if he couldn't have his own room. But still, he wished he had a sibling, since forever. Ware shook himself back. He had a plan B to come up with. Sometimes he felt as if the answer was right there in front of his eyes, right at his fingertips. But the only thing in front of his eyes and at his fingertips was a second hand, second hand, nothing special, movie camera. Chapter 52. Birds, with their height advantage, discovered the moat right away. 
Ware liked imagining the first one doing a cartoon double take in midair. Feet braked out, wings wheeling backward, then spreading the word. The word spread quickly. A giant heron floated in to stalk the wall. A pair of cormorants paddled the circuit and a flock of what looked like black and white scissors skimmed the shallow end all on the same day. The next day, a chattering of wild parakeets settled in the three clean palms like bright little lines. After that, they came every morning and stayed for a few minutes, squawking a ruckus over every move he and Jolene made. Soon after the birds came other animals, rabbits and frogs, chipmunks and squirrels, dragonflies, beetles and toads. A full week after the moat was filled, a comically perfect latecomer crawled into the lot. Ware got down on his belly beside the turtle, his camera pressed to his face. What took you so long? The turtle raised its head in a stately arc, looked straight into the lens and blinked one eye. Ware tapped the turtle's shell with a blade of grass. I dub thee Sir Wink. You are welcome here. Not all the visitors were. One morning, Jolene discovered that the newest contri contribution contributions to her compost had been swiped. What looked like tiny human handprints led to the moat. Raccoons were identified the culprits. They liked to rinse their food. He latched together five window screens and settled the cage over the pile, then weighted it with a board. You can lift it off, but the raccoons can't. Jolene blew her bangs out and studied him. And for just a second, he saw, reflected in those mirror glasses, a kid who was kind of okay. Chapter 53. Ashley started showing up most mornings. She said it was because she liked digging, and maybe that was true. Hand her a shovel, and she always looked ready to burst into song. But Ware noticed that what she was really doing was making the lot into a sanctuary for birds. She scattered the worms they turned up like little presents, and she piled breadcrumbs and raisins and sunflower seeds in the moat wall. One day he saw her sprinkling a trail of something red all around the lot. Cayenne pepper, she explained. Cats hate it on their paws? Ware liked having her around. He liked how clean she always looked. How when a speck of dirt did get on her, it somehow looked intentional, like a piece of jewelry. Most of all, he liked how she ended her sentences on an up note, making them sound like questions even when they weren't. It made you feel included as if she wanted your opinion on things. Jolene, however, picked fights with her whenever she could. It began to bother Ware more and more. My great, 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 great grandfathers tried to kill each other once, he told Jolene one day. That got her attention. Why'd they do that? Well, because of the Civil War, they were on different sides, but they didn't know about me, that they were going to have something in common. You think Ashley and I are going to have a kid together someday? Maybe, but no, I mean, maybe you have something in common with her that you don't know about yet. Jolene sputtered out her bangs at that stupid idea. What do you have against her anyway? Jolene peeled off her giant leather work gloves and tossed them to the ground. The move reminded Ware of knights throwing down their gauntlets to issue a challenge to battle. She lives in magic fairness land like you. Whenever she doesn't like something, her daddy fixes it. Except, unlike you, she actually gets to live there because she's rich. Ware thought it over. He picked up the gloves, the sign that he accepted the challenge. But her father didn't fix anything. She helps here at the lot herself, and she has other places she's working on, too. Getting them lit up for those cranes. It's not for those cranes. Why would a rich girl care about birds? Maybe because she cares about birds. No, -uh, it's probably for a school project. Or maybe she's going to write an essay about how great she is saving them so she can look good for college. That sounds like an assumption. You shouldn't make assumptions about people. Ware heard Big Deal's advice in his head, but he gave Jolene her gloves back, the sign he wouldn't fight anymore. Jolene knew how the world worked. She was usually right. Still, he hoped he was wrong this time. That's where we're going to leave off for today. Tomorrow we pick up with chapter 54. Thanks for hanging out with me. It was nice getting the chance to read to you, and take care, be well.